Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Rapture and the Endurance of the Saints. In this session, we are continuing our theme, our previous study, surveying the consistent perspective concerning the rapture throughout the history of the early church. In previous sessions, we began debunking some of the false claims made by various pre-tribulational teachers in which they claim to have found various pre-tribulational statements in the writings of some of the early church fathers. In this session, we're actually going to look at a few statements, uh, claims made by a, um, an author and minister named Ken Johnson, where he claims that there's actually pre-tribulational statements to be found not in the writings of the early church fathers, although he does claim that, but specifically in the writings of some intertestamental literature, specifically 4th Ezra, sometimes known as Second Estrus, as well as the book of First Enoch. So this is a very interesting claim. Before we jump in, I just want to remind you all that in just a couple weeks here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, we are hosting a conference. It's called the Maranatha End Time Summit, July 13th, 14th, and 15th. We would love to see you there. For more information, registration, go to maranathasummit.com. Okay, let's go ahead and jump in. As I said, we're going to, uh, in this session, examine the false claims, the claims of uh, author and minister Ken Johnson. Now, in previous sessions, we played a couple different clips of Ken Johnson on the Prophecy Watchers program. Um, we played a clip where he claims that all of the early church fathers um, were pre-tribulational or held to a pre-tribulational rapture. In this session, as I said, we're going to specifically look at his claims with regard to 4th Ezra and 1st Enoch. I'm going to go ahead and play the little clip here. Um, again, he was on the Prophecy Watchers program, and then we'll jump in and begin uh, examining his claims. Uh, so where else has this discussion uh, gone down through the ages? Well, I mean, you can first uh, pinpoint some of it in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the book of Enoch mentions it, uh, the Ezra Apocalypse. Uh, we've got it in the book of Gad, uh, several other places. Okay, so you can see there where he says that you find pre-tribulational statements in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he specifically mentions uh, 4th Ezra and 1st Enoch. Now, for clarity, 1st Enoch is a, a book that was very popular during the Second Temple period. So during the time of Jesus, um, and it was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scrolls are a couple hundred years older, earlier than Jesus. Um, and uh, the book of First Enoch was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, Fourth Ezra is actually believed by scholars to be much later, to have been written after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So actually after Jesus. This is largely irrelevant to our discussion, but it's just important um, to highlight. Now, here is the first glaring problem um, with this particular claim, and please hear me. I'm actually going to put up a little visual here. The, the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture, dispensationalism, teaches and holds and always has held that the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture was a mystery that was not revealed until Paul the Apostle. It was not revealed until it was revealed to Paul the Apostle, that Paul the Apostle received the revelation concerning this parenthetical um, period of time known as the Age of Grace, the Church Age, which uh, again closes, according to the dispensational view, with the rapture. So if you read you know, any academic book, any popular book taught by highly respected leaders and teachers in the pre-tribulational camp, they'll all say that the rapture was a mystery that was not revealed to God's people until it was revealed to Paul. Now, then what they'll actually say, they'll go a step further, or most often, because they'll look at the writings of all of the early church and they go, all of them were post-trib. Why, if, if the apostolic doctrine was pre-trib, why are none of these guys teaching pre-trib? Where did they lose it? And so usually what would be said is they would say, well, the early church fell. You know, they got off pretty early. They embraced replacement theology. They embraced amillennialism by the time of Augustine. And this is true. Um, by the time of Augustine, there was a lot of Greek uh, philosophical syncretism that crept into the church and ultimately 
from the time of Augustine forward, the vast majority of the church was, was indeed amillennial. But what they'll do is they'll say also they lost the apostolic doctrine concerning the rapture. So they would say the church fell, they got off, they embraced replacement theology, supersessionism, they embraced amillennialism, and they embraced a post-tribulational rapture, which is interesting. Why in the world, you know, give in terms of the flesh, which one is more appealing, the pre-trib or the post-trib? Um, you know, the tendency would be to embrace the pre-trib if you were going to sort of uh, leave behind the apostolic faith. You're going to choose that which is uh, easier, so to speak. You're not going to slide into believing, no, we have to endure patiently until the end. Like, that's not the direction that you would go. But so again, as you can see here, even with the slide, it says the rapture, a mystery revealed to Paul. But then you've got Ken Johnson saying, no, actually, a few hundred years before Paul, we find evidences of a pre-tribulational rapture in the writings of 1st Enoch or 4th Ezra. And my point is this, is what Ken is suggesting is contradictory. It conflicts with standard pre-tribulational teaching. Okay, so again, I have no horse in the race. This is an in-house debate within the pre-trib camp. But I just want to point this out. If you're a pre-tribber watching this, what Ken is suggesting contradicts what pretty much every pre-tribulational teacher holds, which is that the pre-tribulational rapture was not revealed until Paul. Not a few hundred years before Paul, but at the time of the first century, the apostolic era. Okay, so that's just sort of an interesting point before we even jump in. We're going to start with his claim, um, the quotation that he pulls out of 4th Ezra and, uh, and look at it. Now, again, just for clarity, 4th Ezra, sometimes it's called 4th Estrus. It's also called 2nd Estrus. It's just a different way to pronounce Ezra. Sometimes it's called Latin Ezra. Sometimes it's called the Ezra Apocalypse. All of these intertestamental uh, works oftentimes times they have multiple different names that they go by, but it was an apocalyptic text. When I say apocalyptic, kind of like the book of Revelation, you know, it's sort of a very end time visionary uh, work. It's part of the category of literature called apocalyptic literature. Very, very common during the second temple period. Now, tradition says that it was actually written by Ezra, okay? But across the boards, consensus within the academic community is that it was actually written sometime between 70 AD and roughly 150 years later. Okay, so right up until about 218 uh, AD, they'll say that's the window that it was probably written in. Again, that's just academic consensus holds that. Now, here's the quote. I'm going to start here. I'll read the quote and then we'll read um, Johnson's claim with regard to this quote. So this is 4th Ezra or 2nd Estrus chapter 6 verse, verses 25 through 27. He says, those who survive all these things that I have predicted will be rescued. When I bring an end to this world that I created, they will see those who never died but were taken alive up into heaven. So I look at this and I go, this is clearly a post-tribulational statement, clearly. Johnson looks at it and says, this is a pre-tribulational statement. So here is his claim. Here's the quote from uh, Mr. Johnson. He says, the text says that those people who have survived the tribulation, so they've survived the tribulation, will see the return of the men who have never tasted death but were caught up before the trouble began. I agree with that. And then he says, the two witnesses of Revelation. So here's where he immediately jumps in to argue against what the text is clearly saying. He jumps right in. He says, the two witnesses of Revelation, had previous, they had not previously died, but they will be killed by the Antichrist. So, he reasons out, he says, at the beginning of the millennial reign, the only group of men who had never died but were now returning to earth, could only be those who were in a pre-tribulational rapture. So this is his logic. He says, well, it mentions people who were taken up into heaven who never died. And this can't be the two witnesses. It has to be those who were taken up 
in the rapture. Now let's look at the more full context. This is what we always need to do when examining these claims. We need to look at the full context, the statements before and after the citation that's pulled. As we saw, for example, with Lee Brainerd, there's times where he actually pulls lines right out of the middle of some of his quotations that is very misleading. He often does not read the context before or after his statements. He just pulls out a statement, tells us what it means, and actually twists its, uh, its meaning. So in this case, we want to be Bereans. We want to study the context. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the teaching. If you don't already know it, let me tell you once again that the basis of our existence is Romans 15, 20, where Paul makes it clear that his driving force for mission in the world was to lay foundations for the gospel where there were none and to preach the gospel to those who'd never heard the name of Jesus. And if you would like to join us in that effort or find out more information about how you can connect with us in our pioneering initiatives in the 1040 window amongst people where there are no foundations, you can go to faistudios.org to find more information. Back to the teaching. So I'm going to begin in verse 17. He says, I heard a voice that sounded like a roaring river. Very biblical, right? Oftentimes you have examples of this in the book of Revelation where you hear the Lord's voice or um, the writer of scripture hears the Lord's voice, which is like the sound of mighty waters. And the voice says, the time is near when I will judge the living, the people living on the earth. I will punish those who have hurt others with their injustices. Jerusalem's humiliation will come to an end. And this age, which is about to pass away, will have the final seal put on it. Then I will give the following signs. He gets into some kind of strange things. The books will be opened across the skies. Here are the strange signs. Children only a year old will speak. Pregnant women will give birth even after three or four months. He says, planted fields will suddenly become bare. Full barns will suddenly become empty. Then the trumpet will sound and sudden terror will grip the heart of everyone who, that hears it. Friends will fight like enemies, etc. And then he says, those who survive all these things that I've predicted will be rescued. So again, who are those who survive? It's the saints. The saints who survive all of these things about the tribulation, they will be rescued. When will they be rescued? When I bring an end to this world that I created. And he says, and then they will see those who never died, but were taken alive up into heaven. Guys, the obvious context, the only context here in the first century is that they're talking about the two witnesses. It's not saying those who, survive, who were raptured before the tribulation. Like, there's no hint of this. Now, just to reiterate, what are the things that the Lord says will happen? God will punish the unjust. Jerusalem's humiliation will come to an end. When does that happen? At the end of the tribulation. He says Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles for 42 months. Right? So it's at the end of the tribulation. He says that the age which is about to pass away will have the final seal put on it. Books will be opened across the sky for all to see. The trumpet will sound. These are things that happened at the end of the tribulation. Those who survive all of these things, those who survive, not those who got raptured, those who survive these things will be rescued. When will they be rescued? When I bring an end to the world that I created. Guys, this is a post-tribulational statement. Like it's a clear post-tribulational statement to try to say, well, but then it says here, those who have never died, but were taken alive into heaven. And it's not the two witnesses. And then kind of go through this, this whole, it can only mean this. That's manipulating, that's twisting what is clearly being said here in the text. Okay, now let's look at First Enoch. And this is the one that most people are going to be really excited about. Again, a lot of interest in Enoch over the past several years. Again, Dr. Michael Heiser uh, talked a lot about Enoch, a very influential and important book, but not scripture. Likewise, by the way, 4th Ezra is in the Catholic canon, but it's not in the Protestant canon. These books are not scripture. Doesn't mean they don't have truth in them, but they are not the, the God-breathed word of God, and this is so important. Okay, so here's the uh, claim made by Ken Johnson. He says, in chapter 50 
of the book of Enoch. Enoch refers to the time when believers are changed into a glorious form. So he says, Enoch refers to a time when believers are changed. How are they changed? Into a new and glorious form. He says, we know that is our resurrected bodies. And that event occurs at the rapture or the resurrection. So here is the statement in 1 Enoch chapter 50, verses 1 and 2. In those days, a change will take place for the holy and elect. Hold on. Ken just said that it talks about them being changed into their glorious forms. But I don't see anything here about their bodies being changed. It just says a change will take place. That's all the text says. In that time, for the holy people, a change will take place. What kind of change? It doesn't tell us. And it doesn't say into a more glorious form. And we know that that's the rapture resurrection because it doesn't say that in the text. He's just trying to tell us what it means, but the text doesn't say what it means. It just says a change will take place. And it says, And the light of days will abide upon them, and glory and honor will turn to the holy. On the day of tribulation, now watch this, on or during the time of tribulation, on which evil will gather against the sinners. Now watch this. The righteous. The righteous will be delivered, raptured, snatched up. The righteous will overcome in the name of the Lord of Spirits. And the Lord of Spirits will cause the others to witness these things in order that they might repent and cease the works of their hands. The righteous overcome the tribulation. This doesn't say anything about people being transformed or changed into more glorious form. It talks rather about the righteous overcoming the tribulation. Now, here are really, besides the previous problems that we've already looked at, there are really three more problems. The first is that Johnson uses a very outdated translation. Okay, so among the different translators or the more um, academic translations that have been done of First Enoch, you really have four primary translations. Um, the first one was done in 1883 by a guy named Richard Lawrence. The second, uh, about 10 years later, 1893, and then it was revised 19 years later, 1912, by a guy named R.H. Charles. That is the text that um, Johnson uses which was done in 1912. Why? Because it's, again, copyright-free. Um, e. Isaac, in 1983, did another translation, and more recently, um, George Nicholsberg and James Vanderkam, they released a, a, a translation with the Herminia, um commentary series, a very, very technical commentary series. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. Hermenuia, I don't know. Um, it was done in 2012. Okay, so you're talking a hundred years after the translation that um, Johnson uses, Charles's translation. Now, why is this important? Because when Charles made the translation, they really were only going from the Ethiopic um, translation. Okay, since that time, over the past hundred years, they have found numerous new documents, Aramaic that uh, and Latin that are. The, the book of First Enoch. So we have far better textual um, attestations to go from. And so there's a lot that's been learned about First Enoch. And when you look at the new translation, it doesn't support his pre-tribulational perspective. Okay, and this is so important. We need to use the most up-to-date, accurate, cutting-edge translation, not something that's very outdated. Okay, so um, when we do look at the modern translations, as I said, they speak of the righteous being victorious, being victorious during the trials to come. It says absolutely nothing about them being removed. So again, I just want to reiterate, on the day of tribulation, on which evil will gather against the sinners, the righteous will overcome in the name of the Lord of Spirits. That is not a pre-tribulational statement. Okay, second... Um, when you look at First Enoch, chapter 50 is very short, as is chapter 51. They're like barely a paragraph. Um, when you look at the context, not only as we just saw in chapter 50, but if you just keep reading, chapter 51 also makes some very clear post-tribulational statements. 
And this is so important. Again, context is everything. You can't just randomly point in the middle of a text and go, here's a confusing statement that if you just read it out of context, it's kind of weird and say, pre-trib, where you have other statements throughout the writings of this particular individual that are clearly post-trib. You have to survey the totality of what anyone teaches. You can't just randomly pull out a quote. If I make it very clear and I say, I am post-tribulational, and then later I say something that's a little confusing, you have to weigh the confusing thing against the thing that I said that was clear, right? So here's the statement in chapter 51. It says, in those days, now again, read this very carefully with me. In those days, so at that time, the earth will give back what has been entrusted to it. And Sheol will give back what has been entrusted to it. And destruction will restore what it owes. So it's talking about hell, the earth, destruction. These are all synonyms for the afterlife. He says the earth will actually give back the bodies that have been entrusted to it, the carcasses. In other words, the dead will rise up out of the earth, out of Sheol, out of destruction. And then it says, for in those days, here we go, my chosen one, my chosen one would be who? That would be the Messiah. My chosen one will arise. What does that mean? When God arises, the idea is he gets up off of his throne and comes down and acts on behalf of his people. He says, my chosen one will arise. And what will he do? He will choose the righteous and holy from among them. So it's talking about the coming of the Lord, the return of Jesus. At that time, he chooses the righteous and the holy. For the day on which they will be saved has drawn near. The day in which the righteous and holy will be saved is when? When the chosen one arises, and then it says this, and the chosen one in those days will sit upon my throne. What does it say in Matthew 19 and 25? It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, with all of his angels with him, then he will sit on his throne of glory. When Jesus returns, he will restore the throne of his father David in Jerusalem and rule the nations from Zion. Enoch here in chapter 51 says that when that happens, that's when he will save the righteous. He doesn't say anything about the righteous being raptured seven years before the day of judgment. There's no such concept in the writings of the intertestamental literature during the second temple period. You will not find it. Okay, now let's look at um, the actual first several verses in the book of First Enoch. And this is, this is, I go, how in the world do you miss this? Literally, the first several verses of the book of Enoch are some of the clearest, unarguable, post-tribulational statements that you will find anywhere in the writings of any of the early church fathers, intertestamental literature, or otherwise. Okay, so let's begin. First Enoch chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the blessing with which Enoch blessed, who does he bless? The righteous chosen who will be present on the day of tribulation. Will they be raptured and removed before the tribulation? No, this is literally the first verse of Enoch. He goes, I have this blessing. It's for who? The righteous. And then how does he describe the righteous? He says, they are the ones that will be present during the time of tribulation. During the great tribulation, the righteous will be present. They will not be removed. They will be there, enduring, persevering, bearing witness. And what is the purpose of the tribulation? To remove all of the enemies. The righteous, on the other hand, they will be saved. Enoch takes up his discourse and he says, now this is classic um, Middle Eastern fluff. It's very similar to Balaam. He says, Enoch, and he just starts talking about himself. A righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, who had a vision of the Holy One and of heaven, which he showed me. From the words of the watchers. So the watchers are the principalities. Enoch says, I heard the watchers talking. And the holy ones, I heard everything. And as I heard everything from them, I also understood. I understood what they were saying. And then here he continues. He says, not for this generation, not for his particular generation do I expound, but concerning one that is distant, that's far off, do I speak. Very similar to the statement in um, Numbers 24 when Balaam says, I behold him, but not near. 
a scepter will rise up out of Israel, right? He says, I see him, but he is not near. I behold him, but he is far off. It's a vision for the far distant future. And he says, here he goes on, he says, and concerning the chosen, I speak now, and concerning them, I take up my discourse. So what is the discourse for? It's about the chosen, the elect, the saints. He says, the great Holy One will come forth from his dwelling, and the eternal God will tread from thence upon Mount Sinai. Hey folks, thanks for watching the Maranatha Global Bible Studies. We pray that these resources encourage you. It has been a value to us from the beginning of FAI to produce quality media to resource the global body and give it away for free. Free and free forever. Now that said, if you want to join us in reaching those who do not have the gospel, we invite you to jump in on our $5 a month giving campaign. Literally skip a coffee and you can change the face of the Middle East in the 1040 window. Head to faistudios.org where you can give safely and securely. Maranatha. If you haven't read my book, Sinai to Zion, I highly encourage you uh, to get it. Again, all my books are free as PDF files on my website, on the FAI app. Um, you can get the book as a soft cover on Amazon. I believe it's the most important book that I've ever written. It's about the return of Jesus. And what a lot of people don't realize is that there's actually very solid evidence that when Jesus returns, he will march through the land of Mount Sinai on his way up to Mount Zion. And that's actually what Enoch is talking about here. He says, The great and holy one will come forth from his dwelling in heaven, and the eternal God will tread from there upon Mount Sinai. So he'll either land on Mount Sinai or pass through the region of Mount Sinai. He will appear with his army, and he will appear with his mighty host from the heavens of heavens. At that time, it says, the watchers will fear. Now, ready? And all of those who are hiding in the ends of the earth will sing. So it's talking about, again, the chosen, the righteous. And how does it describe them? Those who are hiding in the ends of the earth. Now, we've seen this in previous um, writings of Pseudo-Ephraim. We saw it in um, Victorinus. Um, these references to the righteous, and what do they do during the tribulation? They hide themselves out in the deserts, in the mountains, in caves. They leave behind the population centers. They flee from the persecution, and they survive by hiding, by fleeing. We see this in the book of Revelation, where the woman who represents Israel is given wings of an eagle, and she flees into the desert, where there is a place prepared for her for three and a half years. So where do... The uh, early church writers, where do some of these get it? This was a common concept, that during the Great Tribulation, the righteous would hide themselves. And that's exactly what it says here. Those who are hiding in the ends of the earth, it's like they come out of their caves and they start singing. They say, the chosen one is here. All the ends of the earth will be shaken. Trembling and great fear will seize them, talking about the watchers, unto the very ends of the earth. The high mountains will be shaken and fall and break apart. The mighty hills will be made low and melt like wax before the fire. The earth will be wholly rent asunder and everything on the earth will perish and there will be judgment on all. Ready? With the righteous, he will make peace. Does Enoch say the righteous will be raptured before all of this? No, it says with the righteous, the Lord will make peace and over the chosen, there will be a rapture. No, it says over the chosen, there will be protection. Peace, protection upon them will be mercy as they do what? Hide themselves in the ends of the earth, right? They will all be gods and he will grant them his good pleasure. He will bless them. He will help them. He gives them help. He blesses them. He gives them mercy. He gives them protection in order that they can endure, in order that they can survive the great tribulation. He says light will shine on them and he will make peace with them. And then here it is. This is the portion of Enoch that's actually quoted in Jude, verse 14. Behold, look, he comes with the myriads of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to destroy the wicked, to convict humanity for all the wicked deeds they have done, the proud and hard words that wicked sinners have spoken against him. So again, we're going to end this right here. The point is this, guys, the very opening several verses of First Enoch. It is clearly a reference to the Great Tribulation at the end of the age. That was a concept that was well understood by the Jewish believers. 
long before the apostolic era, it was understood. We see it in Isaiah 26, where they understood that there's this time of um, birth pains before cosmic global redemption, right? And the Lord says, your dead will live. Those who sleep in the dust of the earth will arise and shout for joy. This was a well-understood concept, but whenever you see references to it, the Lord promises to protect, to help, to assist, to give mercy to the righteous. There is never a single statement about a rapture. The book of Enoch opens with one of the clearest post-tribulational statements that you'll find anywhere, and it repeats further post-tribulational statements. The idea, the notion, the suggestion that, again, as Ken just pulls out this one little quote and says, yeah, Enoch was talking about a pre-tribulational rapture, it's simply nonsense, right? Like anyone that looks at this can go, yeah, that's, that's a bunch of hooey. Okay, so again, we've uh, examined and debunked these claims. Um, as we continue the series next week, we will... Um, I'm not sure if we're going to do it next week or in two weeks, but we're going to look at the book called Dispensationalism Before Darby. That's probably the best academic effort to date among any pre-tribulational um, teachers or academics in their attempt to say that the pre-tribulational rapture was taught before the 1830s. And unfortunately, it's, um, as we'll see, a miserable failure. It's a good effort, um, but it is a miserable failure. So look forward to jumping into that with you all. Until then, guys, have a fantastic week. The Lord bless you and Maranatha.